All right, get your Bibles out and turn to the book of Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We have been working our way through the book of Acts over the last uh, several weeks. We're going to be in here for a while. I, I don't know. Somebody said, how long are you going to be in the book of Acts? Well, till we get to the end of the book. <laughs> All right. And uh, that looks like from now about 2024, all right, is about what it's looking at. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take, but we're, I'm not worried about that. Um, uh, we're just going to work our way through this book of the Scripture. And what we've been looking at as we've been going along, and it's kind of a weird title for a sermon series, but follow me for a moment. We're talking about the triumph of the gospel through the adversity of the church. What we see in every passage, every chapter of the book of Acts, we see something, that wherever the gospel was preached, wherever it was proclaimed, whether that were in, you know, it was in you know, primarily Jewish cities or in the Gentile cities as we get to the later parts of the book, wherever the gospel was preached, it triumphed. The God had a purpose and a plan. We're going to see that today in the life of one of the gospel's greatest opponents. You'll remember a couple weeks ago, we met a guy named Saul of Tarsus. And you'll remember that Saul oversaw the murder of the first Christian martyr. Um, and, and no, by the way, official capacity to do that whatsoever. Uh, Paul was, or Saul was, quite frankly, a terrorist. That's what he was. Um, he, he, he was trying to rain terror down upon the church. He was a very zealous Jew and wanted to crush Christianity. And you'll find that as we look in the passage this morning, he's going house to house. He's got letters from Jerusalem, uh, and he's on his way to a place called Damascus, and he wants to arrest and drag out Christians and take them back to Jerusalem. And by the way, it was not going to go well in Jerusalem. When they got there, more than likely, they would be murdered murdered as well. And so Saul is the great opponent of the gospel, and yet God, in his infinite wisdom, sovereignty, and power, reaches into this man's heart and changes him. Everywhere the gospel's preached, it triumphs. That's still true today. No matter where the gospel is preached in this world, it still has the power of God, and it still changes lives. Now, with that comes the adversity of the church. As I said a moment ago, as the apostles were preaching and new converts were being made, it, it uh, uh, brought about a very negative reaction from the world and many of the, uh, the uh, religious leaders and brought about great adversity. But that's how the gospel spreads. And it's no different in our day and age. The gospel is still moving forward. It is still triumphing. Every place where it is preached, the gospel is triumphing. And yet, it still experiences adversity. So today, I want us to focus in on probably one of the most famous and most incredible conversion experiences in all of the Scripture, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who we know better as the Apostle Paul. And if you want to see how God can change a life, well, then stick around because you're going to be able to see it right here today. All right? I want to read. We're going to read a lot of passages this morning. I want to encourage you to do something. We're not putting them on the screen. All right? And, and, I, and people say, why aren't you putting them on the screen? I want them on the screen. Because you don't pay attention when you put them on the screen. All right? So get your Bible out. I'm going to encourage you to do something. Don't use your phone. Don't use your tablet. Now, I, I'm not against those things. I'm not saying that those are from the devil, but they are from the devil, all right? All right, here's what happens with them. You know what happens. If you're following along with me in the scripture on your tablet and one of those dastardly little uh, notifications come up, have you ever noticed that? Ding! And all of a sudden, you can't help but to think, what, what was that ding? I wonder who's trying to send me some important message on Facebook, all right, or on Instagram. Or to, can I say this something? Nothing important has ever been shared on social media, okay? Trust me, I use it and I share nonsense, all right? It, it, there's nothing valuable there. Turn it off and concentrate on a few minutes. Just get your Bible out. If you don't have one, somewhere around you in your pew, there'll be a copy of God's Word. Find it, turn to Acts chapter 9, and we're going to read down from verse 1 all the way through verse 22, and then we're going to go back and look at some points. 
All right. It says in Acts chapter nine, verse one, but Paul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he had found any belonging to the way, now that means Christians, all right, they, uh, they called early Christians, they referred to them as the way. Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And now pay attention to these passages. And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither uh, ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, by the way, how would you feel if you got that command? Here you are, a believer in the city of Damascus. You know that Saul, this terrible, you know, persecutor of the church is on his way to arrest and bound up Christians. And then God says to you, I'll tell you what I want you to do, go find Saul. <laughs> Every Christian uh, with any half a brain in that day and age wanted to stay as far away from Saul of Tarsus as they possibly could. In fact, notice what Ananias says to him, verse 13. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake, for the sake of my name. Don't miss that last verse. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hand on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who had made havoc in Jerusalem of those who call upon his name? And has he come here? Has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the high priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Now I wanna show you three things about this passage very quickly this morning. First of all, I want you to see something. I want you to see that it is possible to be religious, in fact, extremely religious and still be lost. Paul was, or Saul at this time, I'm just going to call him Paul the whole sermon, all right? Because uh, uh, even though he's Saul of Tarsus when we meet him here, God's going to change his name to Paul, and, and so I'm just going to call him Paul. Paul had been a devout Jew. In fact, over in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, he recounts the fact that he was a member of Judaism's most strict denomination. Back in those days, Judaism had been divided into a number of different camps. Uh, some of them referred to themselves as Sadducees, and, and they were more uh, friendly towards the towards the Romans and some of the Gentile leadership in uh, Jerusalem. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were very strict. They would uh, take and they would memorize the first 
five books of the Old Testament. Not only that, they, they would memorize some 690 different rules and regulations that they would very meticulously uh, handle. In fact, you see these guys all through the New Testament. Every time we meet them, they're all hung up on how are you obeying the rules because they believed that if there was a day when they could get all of the Jews to live out the law perfectly and keep all the law just on one single day that the Messiah would arrive. And so they were very, very zealous for the keeping of the law. Well, when Christianity shows up, Christianity begins to preach something very, very different. It begins to preach that rather than approaching God by rules and regulations, that we approach him through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, you're going to find that Paul changes his mind on this later, and he sees the law, the Old Testament law, in a fundamentally different way. See, the Pharisees thought that the law was the way that you got right with God, that it was the prescription, that, you know, if you go to the doctor and, and there's something wrong and you're having a problem and you go to the doctor, the doctor first gives you what? A diagnosis, right? He says, here's what your problem is. You've got the flu. Here's the problem. You've got this wrong with you. You've got that wrong with you. And, and so that's the diagnosis. It tells you what your problem is. The prescription then is what makes you better. So he says, you know what, you've got an infection. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this, you know, antibiotic and it will get rid of the infection in your body. I want you to take this medicine and it will heal and fix you. There's a diagnosis and there's a prescription. Y'all following me? Well, the Pharisees thought the Old Testament law was the prescription. They thought that's what would make you right with God. And so they were really excited about trying to keep the law. But here's the problem. The law is not the prescription, it is the diagnosis. The law in the Old Testament, its my primary purpose was to show you that you had a problem. If you don't believe that, go read Romans chapter three. That's Paul's entire argument there, is that the Old Testament law shows us we have a problem and it points us to the solution, which is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament law, they would make all of these sacrifices and each one of them had something very fundamental in common. Each one of those sacrifices would require you to bring a substitute. You would bring a lamb that would be your substitute and would die in your place. And when it shed blood was poured out on the altar, it would forgive your sins. It was showing that what we need is a savior. That's the prescription. And so what Paul doesn't understand at this point is that these guys are not breaking the Old Testament, they're actually keeping the Old Testament. You see, the problem, the problem with Paul's religion, and this is a problem with a lot of religion today. Somebody asked me one time, well, are you a very religious person? My answer to that is, no, I'm not. <laughs> All right, religion says... If you do these things, you will be right with God. The New Testament teaches the opposite. It is not doing, it is what has already been done on your behalf through the Lord Jesus Christ. So what Paul thought was, he had misunderstood the law and he thought if I just keep all of the rule, if I can just follow the law, I'll be good. But here's the problem. When we read the law, and Paul says this later on in the book of Romans as well, he says it does something. When the Bible told me not to covet, it awoken in my heart a desire to covet. How many of you know that? When someone tells you don't do something, what's the only thing you can possibly think about doing? The very thing they told you not to do, right? Don't touch. I don't know how many times I have touched wet paint. I hate to say this. I did it two weeks ago. I am a 50-year-old grown man, all right? And I was walking through the hospital, and I saw, I was on the way to make a hospital visit. And I saw a sign that said wet paint, and I thought, I wonder if it's really wet. Yes. Yes. 
That's why they hung the sign there. <laughs> all right? So I had to go into the restroom, wash the paint off my hand, then go make the hospital visit, all right? And tailing, that is why I wouldn't hold little Hojo the day I was at. <laughs> all right? Here's the bottom line, all right? What am I trying to point out? The, Paul was a religious person. Paul went to the synagogue every Sunday. Paul was probably the most religious person in the history of the entire world. He was zealous to learn the law, to memorize the law, to keep things. He was doing everything human possible, humanly possible to, to follow the law and be a good person. He was religious, but he was lost. Here's my concern. I'm afraid that in our Southern Baptist Convention and within many, many other denominations across America, that we have a lot of religious people who have never experienced the gospel. Because I'm gonna tell you, it's not about just being a good person. It's not just about trying to keep all the rules showing up on Sunday morning, going through all the motions. Something supernatural has to take place in our life. It can't, we don't get there by just trying to be good people. Now, I'm not knocking trying to be a good person, but in the reality is, that's not how we get right with God. What has to happen in order for us to see, to, to have a relationship with God is something supernatural. That brings me to my second point. Conversion requires divine intervention. Now notice what happens in this passage. Paul is on his way to Damascus. He is trying to do what he believes is the right thing. I want to squash Christianity. I want to crush it. I want to kill it because it is diametrically opposed to everything I believe and everything my religion teaches. And so he is, he is vehemently attacking it. But notice what happens. God supernaturally intervenes in the course of his life. Now think about that. He's on his way, and, and by the way, there's nothing in any of Paul's writings, and Paul writes about this in a couple other places, he talks about this conversion over later in the book of Acts when he's standing before um, um, Aquila, um, and um, um, he, 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 he's there and, and he writes about it in some of his other books. He never says anywhere, even gives a hint, that he had been thinking about Christianity or considering conversion. Paul wasn't seeking, Paul was found. Paul was on his way to Jerusalem to try to destroy the church. He was dead convinced that what he was doing was right and God stopped him in his tracks supernaturally in one of the most dramatic ways that you could possibly do, strikes him with blindness, stops him dead in his track, and reveals himself to Paul in the most dramatic way. I love how, I, notice what happens in some of the, the key wording here in, in verses number uh, three down through verse five. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I want you to notice something that he does here. He says in verse five, and he said, who are you, Lord? Now, that word Lord there, the Jews only used that word in reference to deity. In other words, Paul recognizes that the voice he is hearing is from God. Y'all following me? He recognizes this is a divine voice. He is encountering God. That's why he refers to him there with the word Lord. And then notice what God says to him. And he said, I am Jesus. If you are Paul, or at that moment, your heart must be about to jump out of your chest, not for excitement, but for absolute fear, because here's what Jesus is revealing. When Paul says, who are you, Lord? He's acknowledging that the person talking to him is God, and then he finds, who are you? And it's Jesus, amen? It's, this is the most radical thing that could have ever happened to Paul. Paul recognizes 
that in the opposition of Jesus Christ and his church, he has been opposing God himself. Now, I don't want to get into all this today. I mean, you understand that God exists eternally in three distinct persons. There's one God in three persons. You say, preacher, I don't understand that. Welcome to the club. I don't either. That's what the Bible reveals, though. And there is the Father, and there is the Son, and there is their Holy Spirit. And they are all three equal And for the first time in his life, Paul is recognizing that this man, Jesus, is divine. And notice what happens. Jesus confronts him with his sin, whom uh, you are persecuting. He says, when you're out there opposing the church, and this is a fundamental way, by the way, to understand persecution and adversity when we experience, they're not persecuting us, they're persecuting Jesus. Because Jesus intimately identifies with his people. He intimately identifies with the church. And so he says, you are whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you'll be told what you were to do. I love that because Jesus, you would think that Jesus would show up. You know, here's how we would write it. If we were making this story up, this is how we'd write it. Paul fell on his knees and he said, who are you? And he said, Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now take this, you so-and-so. Right? That's how I'd write it. Don't look at me, Pius. That's how you would write it. But Jesus says, but go to the city and I'm going to give you instruction. You know what he's saying to Saul? I've got a plan for you. I've got a job for you. From now on, you're going to serve me. And and you'll notice what happens. Now, there was a disciple of Damascus. And of course, we know what happens. He appears and he shows up. You see, conversion is always a radical intervention into our lives by God. That's why in John chapter 3, John refers to it as a new birth. Now think about that for a moment. It's a new birth. Something new has to happen in our heart and in our lives. And that new birth actually comes before we even recognize that it happened. When we recognize it, you know, we confess our sin and we put our faith in Jesus. But in reality, the Bible makes it very clear we can't even put our faith in God unless he does a work in our heart and our life. Let me show you that. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2, real quick. Turn there, fast. Ephesians chapter 2. And listen to what, what, what uh, Paul is going to say in this passage. Ephesians chapter 2, look in verses 8 through 10. Look what Paul says. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, 8 through 10. For by grace, now let's stop and think about what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor. It means that God did not look into your life and see something good and something redeemable and say, you know what? Old Joe is doing a good job. Old Joe is probably a good guy. I'm going to rescue him. No. It's not because God sees something in me. It's because something that is in the divine nature of God. He is a gracious God. Grace means we receive that not deserve. And so none of us deserve, if we got what we deserve, we'd spend eternity separated in hell. But by grace, notice this, for by grace you have been saved. Now let's look at that word for a minute. What does it mean to be saved? Saved just means rescued. If you need to be rescued, by the way, that means you can't save yourself. That means you can't do anything. I remember a number of years ago, um, up in West Virginia and Ohio, where we're from, uh, deep vein coal mining is a pretty big thing, especially back then, not so much anymore. Uh, but, uh, but back in the day, every once in a while, uh, there would be a collapse or an accident. I remember one year when we lived there, and uh, of course, this news would spread around the state very, very quickly. There had been a mine collapse And a group of miners, about eight or 10 of them, were trapped in a coal mine. Now, they had no ability to get themselves out. The veins that they were in had all collapsed. There was no way for them to go out. 
So someone had to rescue them. And what they did was bring in drilling equipment and drill down into a spot where they could be found. And, and the reality about it is they, the, the miners couldn't do anything. The miners were in absolute darkness, had no ability to save or rescue themselves. All they could hope for is that a savior from above would come down and rescue them. Well, that's exactly the description we're in. When he says, you, for by grace, you are saved, he is reminding us that you needed saved. You were dead in the trespasses of your sin. The Bible describes, when it says we're dead in the trespasses of our sin, right there shows you we can't do anything to fix our problem. Dead people can't do anything, amen? That's one of the things that I heard a story many, many years ago about a young pastor who went out to a hospital visit one day, got called, you know what we always often do, to come to the hospital and, and one of his parishioners was dying and he was new, he'd never, he'd never had that call before, he just started pastoring. And they don't tell you what to do in seminary at that point. <laughs> We don't take a single class that tells you what to do, right, Cliff? When they, when they call and say, so-and-so is dying and you just graduated seminary, you don't know what to do. Just be honest, nobody ever told us what to do. And so this old boy went out to the hospital and he got there and about that time, a doctor walked in and the doctor walked in and he, he, he did a couple of things very quickly um, and he pronounced the man dead. Well, the young pastor in his nervousness had done what all young pastors do. We walk into the room and he looked around and he didn't know what to do, so he got fidgety. So he picked up the man's arm and he took his pulse. But the only problem is he took it with his own thumb and if you do that, you'll feel your own pulse. So the young pastor felt a pulse. The doctor comes in, takes the pulse, says the man's dead. Well, the pastor says, I wanna disagree with you I think that he's alive. I felt his pulse. He says, no, you didn't. I promise you he's dead. And so the young pastor said, doctor, could you tell me what are the signs, what are the signs of death? And I love this answer. The doctor said to him, son, there ain't no signs of death, only signs of life. And in the absence of the signs of life, we call that being dead. Well, the Bible says, you're dead in the trespasses of your sin. Why is that? Because you have none of the evidence of life in you. God doesn't indwell inside of your heart. You are dead. You are unable to even resist sin, even if you wanted to try. And so the reality is you're dead. And he says, we were dead. Look, he says, for by grace. Why do we need to save? Because we're dead in the trespasses of our sin through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. He says you're saved by grace through faith, but the faith that you used, that wasn't even yours. God gave you the faith to believe. From beginning to end, salvation is a divine intervention into our lives. God begins that work through the preaching and the hearing of his word. And, and often we fall under conviction. I remember in my salvation, as the preacher was beginning to share, I fell under conviction. I had never experienced conviction before in my life. Don't get me wrong. There were things that I knew were right and they were wrong. My mom's going to watch this DVD here in a couple of weeks. So I'm not going to confess any of my sins to you. Because when I do, I get in trouble. I got grounded. I'm still grounded for like 25 years from two sermons ago. All right? So I'm not going to confess, but I, I was a sinner. Now, here's the deal. They bothered me in the sense that I knew if I get caught, I'd get in trouble. That's not conviction. But then I started hearing the gospel, and I recognized something. My sin was not against primarily the people whom I'd sinned against, but against God. And while my sin had bothered me in the sense that I didn't want to get caught and get in trouble, when I recognized that I had sinned against God, I recognized my soul was in peril. And that is a fundamental difference. God did that work. And as a result, he began to create faith in my heart so that I could believe and I could trust the Lord Jesus. That's what he's getting at. But 
There's a third thing. Conversion results in a radical reorientation in our lives. In fact, in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 2, we see that doctrine laid out, and then we can go back to Acts 9, and you'll see it played out in Paul's life. Look what he says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He's talked about the process of salvation in verses 8 and 9. Look at the results in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here, look at what Paul says. Paul says, you've been saved by grace through faith, and the faith that you have is not of yourself. God's given that to you, otherwise you would boast. But God had a plan in your salvation. God saved you not by your good works, but in order for you to do good works. There's a fundamental difference between that and you have to get that. Religion says do good works and you will be saved. The gospel says get saved and you'll do good works. Y'all following me? You're not saved by your works, you're saved to good works. And so what's he talking about there? Well, the word workmanship is really, it's, it's Greek word poeo. It's the same word which we get, a poem. It was often used in those days to refer to artworks and any kind of beautiful type sculpture or, or crafting of things. Here's what it says, is God is taking your life and he's crafting it and he's shaping it and he's making it into something beautiful. He's taking what was ugly and scarred and marred and messed up and ruined, and he begins to put it back together by his grace. He, you become the workmanship of God, amen? He begins to take and craft it, you know? We love watching, you know, incredible craftsmen at work. I, I was watching a, a show one night on PBS, and uh, Paul McCartney, um, was on there, and, uh, and Paul McCartney, the greatest musician who's ever lived, and, uh, and, uh, and just an amazing, amazing musician. And he said, let's write a song together. And he took, a, took an audience, and they were all throwing out little ideas. None of them were songwriters. And he would throw out ideas, and they would throw out things. And McCartney, because he's a genius, would take those, and he would craft them, and he shaped them, and they wrote a song. That's what God does in your life, but in such a fantastically more beautiful way. He takes your experiences, he takes your personality, he gives you gifts and he shapes you and he forms you into something incredible. And then he uses you to accomplish good works. But I want you to notice something that, that are a part of his eternal plan for which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. That means God in, in his sovereignty. And I, I don't understand all this. This is much bigger than my mind can comprehend that God, before he even saved you, before he even created, created the world. God had a plan for your life. And, and part of that plan was your salvation. But then after that salvation, he has a plan from all eternity past of how he wants to use you to change people's lives and to, and to work for him. Now, now, by the way, Paul could write that because Paul had experienced that. If you go back to that passage in Acts chapter nine, you see that playing out in Paul's life immediately. It, we make, a, we make a, a, a couple of mistakes when we think about the call to ministry in the Baptist church. These are fundamental problems that we have. Number one, we reserve it only for pastors. God has called us as a pastor. That's true. I believe in the call of God to be a pastor. But I also believe this. God has called every believer to be a servant. He's called every one of us to a job. You have a job. I have a job. Everyone in the church has a job. God's called us. And implicit in our salvation is a call to ministry. If you hear Paul tell his story, by the way, and, and, and we won't look at this too deep this morning, but because uh, we'll do it later on. But if you go over to Acts chapter 26, and when Paul's talking to Agrippa there in, in Acts chapter 26, and he's explaining his salvation experience, Paul makes it very clear that his call to salvation and his call to ministry were inseparable. In other words, when God calls us to salvation, he also calls us to ministry. He also calls us to be involved in good works. 
Hey, you see it immediately. Paul gets saved and notice what happens. He goes to Ananias, he's been baptized, which is important. He makes his public profession of faith and he, he declares openly that he's put his faith in the gospel. And then notice what happens. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, but verse 20, and immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. Wouldn't that have been a cool Saturday afternoon? Here you are a Jew, and you go down to the synagogue, and you have heard that Saul of Tarsus is on his way to arrest Christians and to persecute them, and then this same Saul shows up in your synagogue, and, and, and what would have happened naturally, anytime there was a visiting sort of dignitary or leader, they would be asked to speak, and Paul stands, Saul stands up, and they're thinking he's going to start preaching against the Christian church and against the gospel. And what does Paul do? Stand up and say, I got news for you folks. Jesus is the Christ. Now, by the way, how do you think that worked out for him? Well, the same way that we see that happens in the entire scripture. In one sense, there is the triumph of the gospel. Some are converted, some are saved. And they put their faith and their trust in Jesus. But some look at that and go, Saul, now you're the enemy. And, and by the end of the chapter, by the way, notice what happens. Um, in, um, let me just keep reading the verses in verse 21. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he, and has he not come here for the purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. In other words, he probably was taking the scripture and already showing them, hey, Jesus meets up these prophecies. He is the Christ. Verse 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. the triumph of the gospel through the adversity of the church. What Paul experiences for the very first time, if you read the next couple of verses, is they have to help him escape. By night, they lower him down out of Damascus. But you know what Paul does? Paul doesn't shut up. He doesn't stop preaching. The Bible says he goes out into Arabia. Now, when we think of Arabia, we think Saudi Arabia. This is the Roman province of Arabia. This is really right next door to the mess. He just goes over and starts preaching in the next towns over. It's really what he does. Just goes over and starts preaching. And later on, he ends up back home and he preaches. And for the rest of his life, Paul preached the gospel. See, I got news for you, folks. When you get saved, you can't get over it. Amen? Oh, don't get me wrong. There are moments when we backslide. Y'all agree with that? There are more. How many of you here, you've been believing? I, I like to honestly, for you to know, how many of you been, are believers and sometime after you became a be believer have backslid? Now, here's the deal. If you didn't have your hand up, you're one of two kinds of folks. You're lost and you need Jesus or you're lying and you need to repent. Because the reality is, is every one of us have done that. We have... That, in my best moments, I'm following Jesus. But you know what? There are moments when you really don't want to see me. There are moments when I don't really want you to see me because sometimes I backslide. And that happens. But if you look at the course of every believer's life from the time of their salvation to the end of their life, you'll see this. They'll go up for a while, then they'll backslide. But did you notice what's happening? The overall course of that graph is upwards. They're becoming more like you. Oh, Paul had some moments that I think he would like to take back, don't you? I think the way he dealt with, uh, with uh, John Mark is one he'd take back if he had a chance to do it again. I think Paul would say, I would treat John Mark too harshly. I know for a fact, because it's recorded in 2 Corinthians, that he regretted with some of the things that he had said to the church in Corinth. He says that in the second book, that he, he's been too harsh on them. So there are moments when we mess up. Can I say this to you? When you mess up as a believer, don't let that be final. Don't let that keep you. Here's what happens. Satan loves to do this. We mess up, and then Satan starts whispering in your ear. You can't go to church. You can't hear me if I do that. You can't. <laughs> and I, you can't go to church. 
they'll know what you did. How can you believe her and do what you just did or think what you just thought? You've messed up and God doesn't love you anymore. Can I say this to you? All of that is a lie. When you mess up and you fall, you need the church more than ever. Because I want to tell you something, nobody here has it, has it all figured out. We're all messed up. Amen? We are dysfunctional. We sometimes get it right, sometimes don't get it right. But we need each other. So you come back and you say, Lord, I've messed up. The entire Christian life is simply a process of repenting and believing. I mess up, I repent, I put my faith in Jesus, I grow a little bit more, I mess up. But here's what happens. I'll take a couple steps forward, I'll take one step back. But then I take two steps forward and I take one step back. That happens, it's okay. It's why we're saved by grace, amen? He still loves us, he still cares for us. But he'll grow us and he'll change us and he has a plan for you. I love it. This week, Hadley's gonna have her wonderfully made camp. I love that title for that. One of the things she wants to explain to children that have various um, uh, dis disabilities and different struggles, wants to show them that, that they're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God has a purpose and a plan. I love the fact that she's embraced the fact that in the middle of her struggles, God's given her a ministry through it. Guess what? God has a ministry for you, for you. That doesn't come without cost. It doesn't come without difficulty. It doesn't come without adversity. We as Christians want it easy, but God didn't say it would be easy. But through our adversity, the gospel triumphs. Amen.